classifying vessel shapes using automated shape extraction and unsupervised supervised classification. And yeah, this is the menu for the presentation, so I will shortly motivate. Uh, very shortly mention previous approaches, talk about, about shape extraction, then presenting two approaches uh, that we used and two case studies in which we used them, and then try and resume with them. Motivation, and I don't think it's necessary in this room to motivate why we should do numerical classification in archaeology, but it's probably relevant to motivate why we are using vessel shapes and not, for example, decorations in our analyzers. And the reason is because we are thinking that uh, the vessel shapes identify underlying large-scale communities of practice in production and consumption. So, um, vessel shapes as such are more related to, uh, to uh, communication structures, to cover communication structures, habitus, in similar economic practices. And that's probably the most important thing here. We get a much wider area of um, the living world of the people if we uh, concentrate to something that is attached to functional uh, necessities. And also from a practical perspective, um, the vessel shapes are better measurable because we have a metric uh, measurement for these shapes than, for example, nominal characteristics like uh, decorations or rim types or so would represent. To be a bit more specific, um, I listed here some, some general tendencies in which both uh, yeah, features of vessels differ and uh, don't take them too literally, but I think the functional dependency of the sh vessel shape is much stronger, for example, than that of the decoration. So, except for this is a uh, uh, punch decoration that's used as a sieve or so, otherwise it's usually not functional determined. Um, also, the dependency on the local resources, the clay types or so, are much more important in the shape and the decoration and so on and so forth. Also, ad hoc changes are more difficult in case of shapes, while uh, they are easy in case of decorations. And in the end, in the shapes you have lesser degrees of freedom, in decoration you have higher degrees of freedom for your individual production. Um, resulting in that the unit of analysis in the shapes are more the ideal type that you tr can try to um, get out of the data, while in decoration it's always kind of singularity that is within the data. So that's why we concentrated on the shapes, also because of the characteristics and specifics of our uh, individual projects, where we also try to um, compare, for example, vessels that uh, are undecorated with vessel traditions that have a strong decorative uh, tradition. So that is the other practical reasons behind that. So in the ceramic production we have several stages. The design um, is emergent or intended um, result of the production uh, construct, uh, the production process based on an ideal type that people have in mind when producing the ceramics and the creativity within this phase is socially bounded but there is a lot of options for creativity within the social framework of the individual. Then you have the so-called style of action when learned habi habitual movements, manipulations and routines come into play when people shape actually the ceramics. And here still uh, there is a lot of um, yeah, habitus in a Bourdieu sense going on there in the production process. And in the end, the material style, that's the result of that, uh, physical traces and effects on the material, and there you could also probably count in the decorations. And but also things that happen in the pottery process, for example, uh, if there's bad clay, something bends in a way you don't like. Um, but all of these are then very individual for the individual object and not so much reflecting probably general communication structures or those kind of units of analysis that we actually want to analyze. Usually pottery is just a mean to analyze something else. Okay, so that's why we analyze vessel shapes and previous approaches and it's just this one slide uh, because Vincent will later on give an uh, example of, of his approach. Just want to uh, divide that into, and this list is not 
uh, complete at all. But there are um, approaches where you take specific locations on the, the uh, vessel, for example, and measure them at the rim, rim diameter and uh, belly diameter and so on. Um, but there are also the holistic approaches where you take the whole shape of the vessel and transform that into something that you can then feed into a multivariate analysis, for example. The benefit of this approach is, on the one hand, it's much more information rich because you have the whole vessel shape that is analyzed. On the other hand, you don't have to arbitrarily choose some points of measurements on the vessel. And uh, this can become tricky if you compare, for example, yeah, very different uh, objects that have uh, a biconical, for example, with a conical one, then you have probably not a belly. What should you measure there? What should you put in there? So um, the holistic approaches are much more suited to get a get general idea of the vessel. So what is our approach then? And uh, this is twofold. On the one hand, we developed an approach for the shape extraction of the objects from scanned images. On the other hand, we analyze them later on. The shape extraction itself can be done, for our case, by hand. This is our workflow that we used. We load the image, we clean it from stuff that's also there and not so interesting. We enhance the contrast, we close the gaps that are from the scans and contrast enhancements. We fill the inside black. We turn the thing real black and white, so removing the grayscale. Then we, we rotate the object that is really upright, crop the image to the vessel itself, split it in half. The idea is that uh, one half of the vessel as a rotation body represents the whole vessel. You can question that partly with handmade ceramics, um, but it makes computation much more easy. And then we scale that down for example, to 100 pixel resolution. And with that, we have 100 measurement measurements automatically. So that's um, the whole stuff done by hand. It is quite fast to do that if you have someone who is uh, trained with that. That's my uh, stopwatch here. Uh, I can sh transfer this into that in one minute and 20. Maybe uh, student assistants take a bit longer, but it's not, so it doesn't take that long. Thing is, if we have 800 images of vessels, and let's say we have one minute 30 for that, it takes 20 hours of working time to uh, do that. And with that, automatic uh, automation makes absolutely sense if you have want to process a big amount of data. Also, uh, so automation is not trivial in this situation. Scanned vessel drawings uh, have problems. You might have holes like here, here, there are some, some gaps here. You might have um, additional components here. And so a simple image segmentation with just using uh, the background color or making a flat fill to fill everything else here or inside of that here. There's also this nasty inside stuff here. That's not possible. It must, have, must be a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more educated. And what we use there is uh, an algorithm that's called active contours or snakes. And here, this is the, the uh, description from Wikipedia. And here is a live example. So you can see that this red line, I hope this is visible, um, starts as a rectangle and then closes towards the map of Europe and extracting the shape of Europe quite well, although the image itself is very bad for that. So you have little contrast here and no really closed lines here. And this method is used in uh, met um, medical image uh, segmentation quite often, it seems. So I took this algorithm from a Python script transferred it a bit and put it into R and make it available for our purposes. And we have put it into a package that's called Sharpar that shall do in the end not only the image extraction but also the analysis uh, that we are doing later on with that, so the analytical steps. Currently it's doing only that but it does it quite well. So. We have some, and these steps can be automated. Bit of preparation, we have to black and white the image and blur it a bit, that we get wider uh, um, contours. 
Then we can make the image segmentation. You can probably can't see that here, but uh, everything is cut, um, encircled in, in a red line. Then we select the biggest object, hoping that within the picture, the biggest object actually is the vessel. I mean, it might be a brave assumption, but usually it should work. <coughs> then we rectify and crop the whole thing and cut it again in half. <coughs> yeah, this can be automatically uh, done on the, over a whole folder of scanned images, and the results currently work out quite well. I would love if you test this method probably, this, this package, and give me some feedback uh, so that we can improve that. Currently we have just worked with our own data, so there's of course a lot of things that can be improved. Really? Joking? Oh my god. Okay, um, speed us up. So we use two analytical methods. The first is using a PCA in the uh, um, hierarchical clustering because all the measurements we have are in Euclidean space so we can safely use uh, PCA there. The idea is we using the profile distances that we have uh, get and probably some additional nominal variable as input they have to be rescaled then, conduct the PCA, conduct on the result uh, uh, horizontal um, hierarchical clustering using Euclidean and Watt measurements uh, we did that with the package factor miner from R. That's very helpful because it has an automated uh, um, automation that do both steps at once and give you a, a cut in the cluster tree uh, according to the uh, relative loss of inertia. And for the individual clusters within, so I get out here, for example, three clusters. And for the data for the vessels within these clusters, we repeat the process again as taking this cluster as a whole as an input to get a finer segmentation later on. And the result can be such a tree here, like you see here. So with first cluster result, second cluster result, and so on, and those ideal types, the most uh, typical image for that. <coughs> the problem is the non-metric, not Euclidean variables are not considered correctly. All vessels had to belong, must belong to one cluster. That's because the cluster always clusters something into one cluster, full stop. And uh, PCA works on global dissimilarity. This results in suboptimal separation of the individual objects. That's why we also tried out TSNE and HDB scan. TSNE is an ordination method, HDB scan is a clustering method. TSNE is um, considering the um, local neighborhoods more intense than the global neighborhoods. So these distances are considered more relevant than these. Uh, these distances here, resulting in the uh, possibility to un unroll this uh, Swiss roll here, for example, and make that a plane. Um, HDB scan is a hierarchical cluster mechanism where uh, the, it's a density based cluster mechanism where the density of objects in the uh, data set are considered and the benefit of that is that you can get out also these elongated objects as a cluster. Um, okay, the approach is rather, rather similar. We conduct, we use the distances, we conduct TSNE and HDB scan uh, using a package RTSNE and uh, DB scan for that. And for the individual clusters, we repeat the process again within the cluster. <coughs> Problems here is TSNE is a stochastic algorithm, so every uh, ordination might look different. Um, accordingly, also the clustering might differ. To solve that, we do consensus clustering. So we repeat the, the, the ordination several times, the clustering also, and then come up with a final solution that takes a majority vote for the clustering. Okay, just a short browse. First case study, Balbic is of the Ethereum Peninsula, and we are investigating in that case study originally um, copper age and bronze age ceramics, in this case only bell beakers, but the general scope of the project is wider. That's why we had to also uh, concentrate on the shapes. <coughs> For a test case, I just took 200 uh, specimens from uh, the general um, publications. Uh, they include only beakers and carinated bowls, so it's a low diversity of ceramic shapes there. What comes out with eight, uh, um, hierarchical clustering on PCA is we have two clusters here, the um, carinated bowls, the beakers, and a strange cluster here that uh, indicates the um, 
it's differentiated because of the low belly break. It's not bad. And if you look to the individual profiles and the mean of the individual profiles within the cluster, there's some diversity going on, but it's not too bad. Um, so separation on the first axis, the stout beakers, and oh no, sorry. With HDB scan and TSNE, we get a bit of different uh, um, differentiation here. Um, and separation of beakers and the bowls only on the second level. Um, we get a better, um, yeah, better resulting um, homogeneity of the individual cluster, but we also get seven clusters, so that's probably not a surprise. Um, so with TSNE, you get probably a finer separation, but in general, the on this complexity level, both approaches are comparable. But with the Neolithic Swiss ceramics, and I can't go now into detail about the great project of my colleague, but it is about uh, in, with a general, with a common framework, uh, analyzing very different ceramic traditions. And we have very high diversity in this. With uh, hierarchical clustering on PCA, we get something here with bigger forms, uh, bowls, and strange forms. So you can see Michelsberg beaker here and also the dishes. So everything that's strange is put into one cluster, which is probably not so good as a result. And also the diversity within the cluster um, is, is quite high. While with TSNE and HB scan on the first level, the dishes are separated, and then on the second level, we get an explosion of different clusters. Uh, 33 clusters, and if we look to them, they are very homogeneous, the, the resulting shapes, so that's quite a nice result. So, with TSNE, we get a good classification that also makes archaeological sense. So, Michelsberg beakers are separated, and the Beutels. Beutelbecher and the Tulpenbecher specific forms are also separated in individual clusters, which is archaeologically from archaeological perspective very nice. To resume, unsupervised classification as also as an explorative tool can open up new perspectives in archaeological interpretation. Automation is, is useful and in case of high diversity, TSNE and HTTP scan results in much better separation of objects. The package is available at CRAN. I already said object separation from scan images is already usable and we will bring the whole analytical tool chain uh, in there this year. This is Caroline. Those are the places where you can get the presentation and the package. Thank you for your attention.